Hey, welcome to another episode of Worship Tech Tour. We are at the Grove Church in Titusville, Florida. I'm joined by their production director, Kyle Wright, and he's gonna walk us through their system, which I am calling getting a high quality result on a very low budget for an actually pretty large church. You guys have over a thousand, sometimes 1500 people here on a weekend, uh, but we're still running everything on modest gear. They're using M32 mixing console with other Behringer uh, audio gear on the stage. And then they've got some budget friendly wireless microphone setups. Uh, they've got a really unique live streaming strategy where they're actually not doing a true live stream for their worship. They have a different solution instead. And then finally, you'll get to check out their really cool chapel they've got for weddings and funerals so that they're not just stuck with the black box look for every single event at this church, but they have a more traditional space they can use as well. All of this coming up in this episode. Tell us a little bit more about Titusville, this area that and like where the church is situated in. Yeah, Titusville is right here next to Space Coast. You can get on the roof of this building and see a rocket go up, mm. and that's really cool. Um, it's it's kind of developed around the Space Center, and now it's finally growing because the Space Center is growing. What's really cool about this place is most people that walk in here have never been to church before. So it's one of those like, they don't know what they're gonna experience, what they're gonna see, what it looks like from start to finish. So the atmosphere is really cool. It's uh, from a first time perspective, it's great. Uh, so give us a little bit of history about this building. What was it previously before being a church? Yeah, this was a vacant facility for many years and it used to be a grocery store. Um, and it sat vacant for years and nobody bought it, used it or anything. So when we first came in, it was just, it was a disaster. We had to completely gut the whole facility. Let's start with taking a look at these panels on the walls here. Cause when I'm in this space, it uh, has a little bit of liveness to it, but definitely not too much. Doesn't sound like it'd be too overwhelming for your mix. So tell us about this acoustic treatment solution that we're seeing up here. They're like probably four inches thick. And if I were to guess eight feet tall by maybe three to four feet wide. Yeah, we bought this stuff and built it from scratch. We bought the material and then built them. So we didn't have to like call somebody and just say, hey, we want 45 of these. We go to Lowe's, got some wood, built the frames, filled it with treatment and then uh, covered it. We just wanted to help help the room and I mean at the end of the day the more you do the better. The ground is just actually there's concrete underneath this flooring of this carpeting so there's not a lot of treatment in this room besides the paneling but at the end of the day it's just gonna help reflections and keep stuff off the walls. All right so what PA are you running? Yeah this is the RCF HDL 10 rig. We're hanging it off hoist, uh, chain hoist. Uh, we do bring it bit down a bit just to uh, clean it and me being a little bit of a system engineer at heart I like to rehang it and tune it a little bit. Just bring it down and pull stuff out, clean it, dust all the haze in the room. It's something we did invest in, spent a lot of money. So the last thing I would want would be to have issues of that magnitude. We can, we can go through service without a light, but if our PA takes kind of a dump, we're in a kind of a sticky situation. So, and for me, sometimes it's like, I can teach myself stuff or really, or teach some guys some things by just talking through the system and how to hang it and deploy it because you can obviously change the curvature and obviously with this room we can kind of play with that and we can work with what works best by trying and experimenting new things because at the end of the day there's no right answer it's just hey what sounds the best and if we can make a couple changes and it works great if it doesn't we'll change it back the subs were in our old facility at the ymca obviously we're not matching the pa by any means of the subs i think it was just one of those it was a budget but we wanted something with a little bit of power. And I actually did a shootout with DAS a couple of years ago, went down there and heard their stuff. And I think for the price point, it was a great system. Hanging a point source system in here didn't really make sense because it's not a big room, but it is long. And the width of it, it just made sense dispersion wise to, to go with this PA. Not many church mix engineers are also touring engineers. How do you feel like that's informed the way that you support this worship ministry here, like your experience on the road with a PA and such. Things like, I don't know of any tech directors who are regularly like tuning their speakers that much. That's a skill that I want to keep sharp. Got it. So, and I have this facility seven days a week and especially in tuning it, this really isn't the probably most ideal environment mm -hmm. of the room, but I can come in and it's funny how I'll tune, a PA, tune this rig and then three weeks do it again. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, 
I have completely different results. But still achieving what I want to achieve, but at the end of the day, I'm still learning. Yep. You're, you're always growing, so. But coming from the road, it's like, I'll go mix. I remember there's a time where I flew and mixed an arena and came back and within seven hours was mixing this morning or that morning here. Yep. And it, it's, it's cool because it's humbling, one. I'm more excited and nervous to mix here than I am on the road. But I could take that experience that I learned and knowledge that I gathered and share it with one, the church as a whole by me sitting in that seat, mm -hmm. but two, sharing it with my, my techs. That's funny how you mentioned like you'll go to a large, you know, kind of a high-end venue with probably a high-end system and you feel like that's actually easier to mix on oh, than, than a kind of a mid-sized church with a lower budget venue, right? Absolutely. Um, and that's, uh, I, again, I think a lot of you guys can empathize with that. It's like, man, yeah, if you're in a venue that kind of has a Cadillac of a system, it's like all perfectly dialed in. It's easy. It's a... It's actually a lot easier to be a mix engineer in that yeah. environment than it is showing up to a, a building that used to be a, a, a grocery store and now is a, you know, five, 600 seat auditorium. Before we continue on with the video, a quick word from our sponsor, the Worship Ministry School Accelerator Program. You may not know this, but in addition to all the YouTube content we're creating here at Churchfront, we also partner with local church worship and production ministries to help them hit their ministry goals. Over the past four years, we've worked personally with hundreds of worship ministries around the globe. We've helped churches navigate upgrading their worship tech, building better systems to grow their team of volunteers, as well as address any knowledge or skill gaps required for modern day worship ministry. When you join the Accelerator program, you get access to our entire library of online on-demand courses and you get unlimited access to our team of Churchfront coaches. To learn more about joining the program, click the link below this video to apply and schedule your free strategy session today. Now let's get back to the video. So over here is our dryer. It makes great noise. All right, here is the uh, stage box setup. So it looks like you guys are running the Midas or Behringer? Ecosystem. That is the DL16, the Midas. All right, so then we got and then some wireless mic setup going on here. So yeah, just talking about how you guys are capturing vocals and we'll walk through the instruments, but give us kind of your rig rundown here. Yeah, you'll notice this facility has a lot of, we're kind of work in progress. We're getting ready to switch over everything to ULXD. Right now, this is just our program mics, our lapels and lobs. All the QLX is for program and handheld stuff uh, for the vocalist. And you'll see some of it we're not even using just as we're kind of going through this whole process. The stage box, you'll see it's a little bit of a mess because half of it's running out there. We don't bring in a lot of new stuff. This is more me trying new things and not having to spend the time and pull, unplugging stuff from stage boxes. I can just home run something for right now because we're, we're literally right there. And then at the bottom of the rack, just because of how this facility is laid out and where I needed to send stuff, we put our Novastar drive for the LED wall. How do you like the RF venue antenna combiners? Oh, love it. I mean, you can c cascade them. They're solid. Um, I personally like the like the Distro 4 because it's one antenna instead of having two. One antenna for four units? Yes. Okay. Well, you can also cascade them down. Okay. And you could, I mean, you could be running 16 channels of RF off one antenna. The greatest achievement of mankind, it's not the space industry that we see a couple miles away from here, but it is the X32. We're in monitor world. Walk us through what we're seeing here. Uh, yeah, pretty simple. Uh, the X32. This was actually our very first console as a church. Um, we had this at the YMCA and it's kind of seen uh, its days. Man, look at the wear and tear. That is, that's... that's some of it was self-inflicted. You know, we wanted to really see what it was capable of doing. Because how old is that X32 by now? It's probably 10 years old. Yeah, so that's one of the first models. And the, are there any bad faders or anything like that? Nope. Not that Wowzers. Let's find out. Yep. Oh, we're good. Wow. Everything still works. So we just basically ran out of DSP and the M32 and wanted to expand and give everybody stereo ears and full control of this. And what's going on out here is very streamlined. The drum inputs stay the same. The guitar inputs stay the same. We could streamline this and the band's happy. We can work with the EQ and everything on the vocals and guitars to kind of just mainstream it so they enjoy it a little bit better. So all the source inputs go to the DL32 yep. that's on the other side. And then from there you have this console connected over AS50 mm -hmm. to that stage box, and then you have their console front of house. Correct. AS50 to the stage uh, box. Trim so. control here, if we need to juice up or down some okay. inputs. Head amp game control comes from the front of house console. We're running 14 outputs, so. Like mono mixes? All are stereo, but the last two. Okay. The keys and drums are actually the mono source. 
Um, and really, that was just to give everybody on stage wireless packs. Got it, including keys and drums. Yes. Yeah. And at the end of the day, half the band likes the stereo, half don't care. So, in fact, half the time they'll show up and they're like, why is everything in the right ear? And we have to explain to them how that works. So, How do you like those Sennheiser units? They're great um, for what we're doing. Obviously, I'd love to go, sure, PSM 900 or 1000, but it's been a great little system. No issues, really. I mean, if RF is clean, then the band's happy. So. Walk us through your in-ear organization set up here. This is most of our band for the ones not using molds. We can kind of save some cost because these little ear pieces, I'm sure everyone knows, is very expensive and they get tossed. Half of them are probably laying around this room. So this is kind of just Wait, a your worship band members don't take care of their headphones? Are they supposed to? We supply some Shure 215s to everyone, like youth group and, and ones that don't have their molds and kind of half the band now is starting to get to where they're they're either using their own or they they have some molds. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of found a way to organize all the IM packs and guitar packs. Obviously the, the battery drawer, Amazon Basic. Yep. I but thought they were yellow. Did they just change the colors? When you buy them in 300 packs, I think oh. they come white. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah, you know, they're, they're cheaper, but we don't really have issues with them. Also for sale, five bucks. What do you do with all that? People grab them for their Wii remotes. And honestly, this thing's net, it's, we probably, filled this a hundred times and they just keep, yeah. youth group probably thinks those are the new ones. So their stuff dies halfway through service. <laughs> no one's told them yet. Look at over here, we've got some nice organization going on. It's always like this, right? You didn't spend any time prior to this tech tour. Nope, my band this. is great. They put their stands right where they're supposed to be. Oh, amazing. I don't even need to reorganize this ever. In all seriousness though, this is a nice little space to have. Most, I feel like most churches don't have the luxury of this like, nice little side stage storage area right off the stage. Yeah, and it, it's one of those, It on a Sunday you got cases laying out. So the, I mean, some of our guys love multiple guitars and kind of working with their tone on their amps. Uh, we have amps available for um, kind of like youth group and anything that's, uh, uh, we want to try other things. In fact, this box right here is a little ISO cab. There's a cab inside of there, mic'd up. But most of our guys bring their amps or they're all, uh, was it now, Neural DSP and Kemper? Yeah, that's what all the cool kids are using. Some of our guys are tone junkies, so they'll bring their amps back here. So they got plenty of room to kind of play and spread that out. And it's, it's loud. If you're standing back here during service, it sounds like a glorified Sam Ash back here. Can you bleep that part out? <laughs> all right, so you are a hang cables on the wall type of guy, not a bins guy? I am. And if you got really close and did an inventory here, I guarantee you, you would notice this is not an HDMI cable. Mm. But who's paying attention? I mean, this whole spot is just storage of random stuff that we may or may not use. You'll see like an X32 rack that we'll take with us for any portable events, um, some random cases, more SDI for stuff we're working on, spare LED panels and parts. Walk us through your drum rig. First talk about the drum set, and then let's talk about all the mics and such. Yeah, we got a 10 year old, piece together kit. Isn't this your dream drum kit set up? Uh, not necessarily, but it does, <laughs> don't let the looks fool you, it sounds pretty good. We do work with some triggering and stuff like that, um, but at the end of the day, the shells sound good. Uh, it's really funny when I see my drummer tuning this rack tom, because we're actually sampling this rack tom. <laughs> and um, it makes it feel good up here. Uh, the mic is currently for show but we're sampling some of this stuff. So on a given Sunday, what's being mic'd, what's being triggered? Uh, current, because it changes, but right now, snare is the mic. Uh, rack and floor tom are both triggered. Um, and that's to just keep things consistent on from Sunday to Sunday. If I'm here or if I'm not here, uh, whoever's up there mixing doesn't need to be twisting gates and changing everything to a different drummer. If you're it's, triggering uh, like the toms, do the, does the drummer hear the mic or the trigger? They're actually hearing the trigger. The mic is ran and plugged in and then just swapped out at the, at the, uh, the stage rack right now. And then these are the devices back here. We just kind of did some soul searching with samples and what sounded really good. Uh -huh. And if you actually spend some time with those on sensitivity, and all that, they can sound really dang good. Kick is a Beta 91 inside only. How, f how effective are these baffles at reducing bleed? Probably not at all, Probably. honestly. Uh, it might take a little bit of the shear off, but at the end of the day, reflections are hitting this wall with no treatment around here yep. and bouncing right back out. What's cool is our drummers do know how to play with some control and dynamics, which is great, but we have a vocalist standing right here and that mic's wide open, you're gonna hear snare and 
hi-hat and cymbal bleed, so. What's your bass guitar uh, rig? Straight off their bass into a Sans amp. Trusty old Sans Trusty amp. Trusty Sans amp, and there it goes it straight to the rack. There it is. Yep. And then your tracks rig, that's back here somewhere? We are running Ableton off yep. this MacBook Pro back here. We do have the Play, play, play Audio PB12, yep. All right, Jesus, this LED wall. Tell us about what's the story behind this LED wall, because did you guys pay $50,000 for this? Uh, no, we did not, because it, it came off the road. We got a good deal on it. It was a little beat up, and at the end of the day, we kind of looked at it like if we get a year out of it, we made our investment. Technically, it's ground supported on a custom-built cart back here that was came off the road just like that, so we just put it together and plugged it in. It's been solid, it looks great. It's kind of really brought a cool dynamic to um, our Sunday morning experience because we can do a lot with it and it looks really good. I mean, that's where all the nice uh, kind of benefits happen where it's like, if you know people and you have a good social network, especially within the production world, there could be a lot of scenarios where churches could benefit from like tour gear that sure. people need to retire. It is like, hey, in a church setting, it's just gonna sit there. So it could probably last a lot longer than oh, it would absolutely. on tour. Absolutely. So, that's a, Good, good advice for you guys listening if you want to ask around and find some deals like that. All right, we are here at front of house and this is a very well put together custom tech booth you guys have made. We'll start with audio and then we'll make our way down the tech booth. So tell us about this. Uh, we'll obviously get a Midas M32, but what's going on over here? Yeah, so we're running a, a Waves Super Rack system. Uh, everything's hit, uh, running into it input wise. Waves is probably on every channel doing something. Uh, we don't really rely on it because I'd hate to lose the sound grid network and then you lose everything that's going on on stage. But we do use it for small things, tuning, some compression. F6 is a great plug-in, does a lot of cool things. Running a smart rig, that's really for probably me more than anyone else. When I'm here, I do like to, uh, to kind of monitor SPL. We are calibrated properly. Tell us about that setup. So you got the mic right there, the yep. reference mic. Yep, Audix TM1 um, running into a Scarlett 2i4 down there. I mean, on Sunday it's just open so I can see SPL if I'm just, I can walk up into the booth and see what's going on. And then it's going into the Mac. Marty's running on the Mac. Got yes. it. So you could run Smart on a Mac and mm -hmm. use that as your host computer for Waves. Yep. Got it. Is it pretty simple getting Smart to, uh, set up? Or? Oh yeah, it's, I mean, once you understand Smart, you, you can, do a lot with smart, or you could do a little and still achieve everything you want to do. From a tuning, it could be as simple as one mic in your reference and pull it right up. I can probably get a tuning. It'd take me more time to get a cable right out there than to really pull up the um, transfer function in there. Maybe someone needs to make us a smart tutorial. All right, let's take, let's take a look at your M32 Layout, man, the M32, I've got so, mem so many memories of it. The last church I worked at, uh, full-time staff, I transitioned us from an old analog console to one of these things, and I had no clue what I was doing, but I just remember how excited I was about the M32. It's honestly a great desk. Um, we'll do, I'll even, in the touring world, be on fly dates, and if they give us an M32 in modern world, or even front of house, I'm not mad about it at all. Uh, mainly because I can fly through that console. Yep. You know, you can, you could be on a, the, was it the new Quantum 8 that just came out? Mm -hmm. But if you don't know how to, to get through it, I mean, by the time you get something dialed in, your show's over. Pro Presenter Station. Yep. With that deck link. Deck link back there. Behind here in the Sonnet. And just a good old typical yeah. iMac running Pro Presenter. Yep. This is probably an older iMac than you think. So here's an example of using the power of looks to be able to send separate content to the side screens here and then disabling that for the center screen um, so that you know they're basically running all this off of of just one instance of pro presenter um, to send content to, to each destination uh yeah so we're running their zebra lighting pictures but i had a buddy of mine just knew him from the business and touring and he had a relationship with a guy that i think builds these lights and when i was looking for something cost effective and still powerful. He recommended these guys. And when I looked at the price compared to doing everything like R2, Chave, and Oralation or anything, it was half the cost. Front wash, um, it's kind of, we're not individually controlling front wash, it's just a full stage front wash. Got it. Um, we do have some kind of speaker lights that we're careful with because it does hit the LED wall. The uh, upstage truss is 
a mixture of four wash fixtures and four beams. Um, and I'll throw them out here a little bit. And those are the zebra, zebra lights? These are, yeah, the whole rig is zebra. Okay. Except for some of the, the Fresnels. Um, we can do a lot with these. They look good. They're a little noisy, if I had to complain about any of it. The washes are quiet and the beams are the one, you can hear the fan kind of burning. And these are cool. We use a lot of little effects with them. The uh, gobos look pretty good. Do some cool stuff with that in the movement world. I like those. Those are cool gobos. Yeah. Um, we got four beams on the ground as well, or on the risers. We don't use these a ton, but we'll use them more in our worship night or for just um, kind of bigger worship sets. Just because to get them anywhere, we kind of got to hit the crowd a little bit with them, which we try to stay away from. The cheapest lights we have are these LED tape arrows. Um, we put these up and they were originally like a Christmas tree thought. Leadership said, we, when are we taking the trees down? I said, well, they're not trees, they're arrows. So now we can keep them since they're arrows. <laughs> we do have two washes up on the truss in front of the audience. We'll kind of use for spotting something or just a wider wash. Sometimes we'll do room stuff with it. So tell us about your video philosophy and how you guys are streaming right now. Right now it's super simple. Single camera shot from the back of the room. Currently not live streaming our services. We're pre-recording everything and then recording the message at eight o'clock and kind of filling that, um, the gap in, I think we're using Final Cut right now. So you have and three services on Sunday morning? Three services. Um, and it's just, we'll get there with the live stream. We've tried it a few times on our bigger services like Christmas and Christmas Eve. In COVID, we started to record, pre-record all of our, everything. In that worship, we had a catalog of worship. So uh, we started using that. And we didn't want to go back to kind of like a still um, static camera shot because we kind of changed the, the vibe that we were going for. So until we can really do it right, we're not going to go fully live stream. So that's why you'll see Video Village is actually up here and not somewhere in the back where someone's mixing or listening and changing camera angles. But we have started to implement some new stuff like iMagging baptisms, where iMagging the message during service now. And we do have some HDMI and uh, SDI around the room. So our bigger services, Easter, Christmas Eve, we can bring in a couple cameras and add them in here. You'll even see like there's a, I don't have them labeled now because we're just currently not using them, but we'll put three or four more cameras and we'll switch for uh, the recording of our live service. Uh, we do stream it at okay. 11 and then it can be obviously played back later. All right, this is your lone camera setup. Yep. Black Magic, is it a 6K or 4K? 4K. 4K with a 70 to 200, 2.8. One of the things about modern worship spaces is that they're kind of big black boxes, like the ones you just saw, and it's not really a compelling place to have weddings or funeral services. Um, it just doesn't really, stylistically, it, it's not a good fit. So it's cool, I like how you guys here at the Grove have this like separate entryway, we're right next to the, your main lobby, into this chapel. So tell us about the story of this chapel and, and kind of some of the tech solutions you've got set up here. We knew we wanted to do this after we were already in the facility. Just we wanted to get in there and then we'd worry about this space. So we've used it for funerals and weddings on a weekly basis. We'll do small events in here as well. Mm -hmm. And then on a Sunday, we use this facility and we started out just doing a full chapel service, but it just wasn't really paying out the way we wanted it to. So we converted it to a overflow and we'll kind of push the stream, what's going on in that room mm -hmm. into this room. Yeah, so you're just sending a mix, like the main mix into the speaker system. Yeah, I'm actually sending a bus mix so we can make adjustments because obviously when you have a room feed, it, some things don't sound good when you solo them up. So yep. sending left, right didn't make sense. We just kind of, a, a, I can get on iPad and make an adjustment. Obviously some acoustic paneling in here. I have a cool little mono single source hang or single point hang yep. up there. Uh, we got a couple of channels of RF down there. So any weddings or funerals, we can just kind of pop in a mic and yep. some playback. And also the ability to do a full acoustic session here. The console in here. The reason for this is, uh, you know, this whole facility, I want to be very streamlined and anyone can use it. So if you know how to use that room, you can kind of work your way around this room. Mm -hmm. And same thing in our student centers, we have another M32R in there. Mm -hmm. So I only need to teach or kind of show one thing. So we're running the SDI line straight over from the program feed on the switcher in the main room. Mm -hmm. um, and someday we'll kind of drop the screen down and we'll kind of leave this whole room open on a Sunday. Obviously there's sunlight in here. We wanted to kind of keep and maintain this natural chapel look, but um, obviously with cheaper projection, that can be a struggle. So we definitely invested in a nice little projector up there. 
and we'll stream over that service. The center screen has full program, so when we switch to a, a slide, it switches over for a couple seconds and all that, and then the worship is also shot from the back of the room in there, just streamed into here. I think this is an underrated idea for a lot of churches, especially new builds out mm -hmm. there, because um, again, it's just like, it's cool to build the big black box you have 100% control of, like, amb like there's no ambient light, you can have perfectly treated room, but there's also important things that a church needs to do, like funerals, weddings, and things like that. And it's important to have a space for that um, that's gonna feel appropriate for the people who attend. So mm -hmm. I love it. And again, this was just, before you built this out, it was just a part of the big lobby area. Yeah, I think this was actually a liquor store. When it it was, used to be a liquor store, It wow. was part of the, the, uh, yeah. the grocery store. Very but yeah, it was just an empty, I mean, it was kind of gutted because we were, it was yeah. the construction of it, but uh -huh. uh, we had a cool little vision and it was cool because I was around when we, actually was building this facility. So mm -hmm. I kind of did set it up for future. We can do a lot of stuff even down the road when the resources become available. There's a projector on top of that truck and we'll shoot onto this wall, the program feed. And that's oh, one of nice. those like, <laughs> there's just people hanging out here. It's like some people just enjoy the community yeah. or their kids crying so they have to push them in here mm -hmm. and you'll see them just talking and yeah. enjoying community but now they can still have the experience out there. And you know, yeah. we fill that whole wall, it's kind of cool. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. I said half this facility is not even. Oh wow! Yeah. Jeez. Oh, the warehouse, dude. Yeah. Like so much this is the Grove space. storage facility. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. Lots of thoughts that'll go into that when we can. This is what's called the Rise. Um, the Rise. It's the got rise. a great like student center name to it. It needs like a Gen. Maybe it needs like a Gen Z name. Well, it's a bus it's, and rise. The bus yeah. and rise. Area. Oh, they're, just, they're just vibing in here. I mean, this place is usually there's balls flying everywhere. Drop ceiling getting knocked out left and right. Slowly developing Based. this room as well. We're getting ready to kind of think through our production here to kind of up some lighting because if you notice, there's actually no lighting in here right now. Uh, we have a Jesus sign this, that actually lights up. This used to be we had this on top of our drum riser in the YMCA. Wow. Every letter is like, it's all LED tape. Every letter could be mapped out. Nice. It still works 10 years later. But yeah, so there's not a lot of production in here, obviously, a streamline. It's probably a good idea for youth room, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, I never, they never call me on this Youth rooms room. are where pr production gear goes to die. Yeah. Like it's, it might have almost died in the main room and then you could just retire it here. Yeah. Get the, get the. Yeah. The dustiness there too. My boss is gonna watch this video and make me go dust everything. Huh? Um, so just running a pro presenter, um, sourcing the second display out to the projector up here on the wall. Just big screen. They'll actually use that recorded footage of worship that we kind of have a database of, and they'll use that in the morning for kids. We're still working on developing a worship team in here. How often are you guys recording more worship songs? Uh, we were trying to do it every couple months. It's really just kind of what our schedule looks like. What in the world? The name tag ball. Yep. I've seen a gaff tape ball before. I've used gaff tape, but name tags, a lot of name tags. That's yeah, cool. and it's probably all name tags too. Yeah. Streamlined, two channels of mics in here. And I'll be honest, this is kind of one of those, I've taught them how to do the few things you could do in here. Yep. And I never hear about it. Like it's, it kind of runs itself. Sometimes we'll have some issues with the mapping of the screens, but that's a, all 2021, I was on tour 80% of the year. and. I could pop in every Sunday or whatever. Thursday nights, there are band rehearsals in the main room. I found a sweet tool called Remote PC. It's mm -hmm. like 80 bucks a year, and mm -hmm. I can get on my phone and control every computer in this facility. So whenever there's an issue, like services from a pro presenter lyric standpoint, I could go program all that. Waves tuning, I could program all that remotely. So when my team shows up, mm -hmm. it's ready to go as long as they can turn it on. That's cool. I fully, made that part Fully easy. remote tech director jobs. Yeah. It's kind of what we do at, uh, with church front and the clients we support, we, we do install the uh, remote PC software and we can we can hop in and do, do the same exact thing. It's oh, like yeah. having a virtual tech director. Yeah, and it, it is kind of cool and funny that, you know, we went that whole year of 2021 where I was in and out and we never had one show stopping moment. Mm -hmm. We had a few that I had to like pop in. I, was, I remember being in a bus going down somewhere in I-40 in Tennessee or something and I'd be on my iPad six o'clock in the morning, 5.30, just remapping something or changing the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. And it was, I mean, I'm happy to have been able to have that opportunity. That was cool. Leadership kind of trust me to be gone. Mm -hmm. And I was able to prove that trust, like, hey, That's Kyle's cool. still, it's gonna work. Now that I'm here a lot more, I can start working on all the things everyone's probably commenting on right now. 
Yeah. So. Kyle, thank you so much, man, for taking us on this tour. Really appreciate it. Guys, make sure you like and share this video if you found it helpful and check out all of the resources down below our free worship ministry toolkit, or you can click and uh, learn more about worship ministry school if you'd like our team's help in taking your worship tech to the next level. See you next time. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a drum kit. <laughs> no, it's out on. It's true. <laughs> it's great. Keep it this way. Um, Sorry, I, I knocked over the light. I've... Who hired this guy? <laughs>